Hi, bookworms. Welcome to Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and my guest today is Jess Seagraves. Jess is an avid reader based in Utah who focuses on diverse voices across all genres and age groups. Jess also runs the wonderful Instagram review site called Reading Mountains, a thoughtful and insightful part of the Bookstagram world. And by the way, if the term Bookstagram is unfamiliar to you, we're covering that today too. I'm really happy to talk to Jess today about why Stay With Me by Ayobami Adobayo is the best book ever. For more information on how to support this podcast, check out my Patreon. For about the cost of a latte, you will have access to all sorts of bookish goodies, including exclusive interview clips that are only available to my patrons, advance notice of all the books we discuss, monthly book club menus, and curated book lists. Go to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash best book ever to learn more about how you can help me keep the candles burning over here in my reading cave. Now back to the show. Hi, Jess. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, thanks for having me, Julie. I am delighted to have you. Jess, I found you on Bookstagram, which is one of my favorite corners of Instagram to hang out on. Can you can you tell our readers what Bookstagram is? Yeah, Bookstagram is kind of that sub niche of Instagram where people predominantly are talking about the books they're reading, the books that they loved. They're sharing stacks of what they're thinking about reading next. There are lots of acronyms thrown around like TBR standing for to be read, uh, things like that. And so pretty much the entire culture is around books and reading and the love of those two things. And how, it tends to be very young people, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny that you mentioned that because in my first Meet the Books to Grammar post, I actually shared my age and I felt very much like I was in the older segment of the Bookstagram population. I'm in my early 30s, so definitely not, you know, I'm definitely middle of the road, you know. Um, but Bookstagram does tend to be much younger. I, I interact uh, with some friends on Bookstagram who are, you know, entering college, who are in their early 20s or mid 20s looking for that kind of community aspect. Um, but on the flip side, I also interact with a lot of people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s as well, who are talking about their love of books. From the limited amount that I've seen, it's a really positive, it seems, positive and um, supportive environment that I have seen. Do you feel that way? I do think overall it's a really positive environment, but part of that is also curating who you're following and who's whose content are you consuming? Because it's very easy to get inundated with content. I mean, in our daily lives, from the news, from books and other formats, then with social media on top of it, um, you just have to be careful about who you're following and whose content you're consuming. Is it your sense that a lot of the bookstagrammers are actually readers? Because I have occasionally come across some where I think these pictures are stunning. I'm not sure that anyone actually read this book, though. Yes, that is definitely, I've seen that before. And usually you can tell based on what they're saying about the book or how they're engaging with the book in general, or if they're they're talking about it or featuring it. Um, that's often a thing that people on book tour will do. They'll have a feature, which isn't the same as a, re- as a review. So mm-hmm. in a feature, they might just drop a synopsis and talk about when it's being published and kind of like the high level points. And for me, what I'm seeking on Bookstagram is much more of that. What are you reading? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? I love really strong opinions about what someone liked or didn't like about a book. So that's really what I'm in pursuit of. And that's usually who I follow and interact with. And tell me about the role of reading in your life. Were you always a reader? Yes. So uh, according to my mom, she says I was reading as of about three, three and a half, which seems really young to me. But um, I guess she worked with me on the ABC. So she would know better than I would. But Um, I have always loved reading. I loved being read to. I loved picking up and thumbing through books as a very young child. And then as soon as I could read, I just wanted to go to the library all the time. Um, 
there's a, a funny little memory that I have of my mom giving me an option saying like, you can pick one book to buy. Like we would go to the bookstore or, you know, we could go to the library and we could just take out as many holds as we can or take out as many books as we can. And so for me, the library was always a refuge because I was devouring books. I was always in pursuit of new ones. Um, so yeah, it's always been a part of my life. And what about now? How often, I know you work full-time because we had to schedule this around your, sounds like very intense work schedule. So what is your reading life like now? Yeah, so my reading life is predominantly in the evenings and on the weekends. Um, I'm not much of a morning person and I have a hard time disconnecting from work on lunch to, to read. Half the time I'm you know, barely waving to my husband on my way through the kitchen <laughs> before I have another meeting. So uh, right now it's mostly evenings and weekends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what kind of things do you normally read? I am really not picky about genre. I probably read everything except maybe like Christian fiction. Um, i trying to think of there's anything else, but I'll read literary fiction and contemporary fiction are kind of my mainstays um, and a subgenre of that being historical fiction. I, I kind of, I don't like to separate it out per se. I also love fantasy and science fiction, romance. I'll dabble in horror, uh, mysteries, thrillers. I mean, nonfiction, memoir, I, I cover the gamut. I'm so interested to hear how you came across this book that we're discussing today. Stay with me. You know, I was trying to remember how I came across this book. It was um, at the time that I read it, I was part of this Slack community for that Book Riot used to host called Book Riot Insiders. Hmm. And I think we had gotten started talking about recommendations there. And I'm pretty sure I had heard about it from a friend, Sybil. Um, and at the time too, I was in a really, uh, I was in definitely the mode of picking up a lot of Nigerian fiction. It was the same year that, Leslie Neka Arima's uh, When a Man Falls from the Sky was published. Um, I had just gotten done reading a lot of Chimamanda, Chimamanda and Goze DJ's uh, works. Um, and so then I picked this up and I just loved this book because I think it has so much for everyone. Um, it's a good crossover for people who like different genres and who are looking to diversify their reading and and get a glimpse into someone else's lives. Will you give a short synopsis of the, the plot of this book for our readers who maybe haven't come across it yet? Yeah, so it takes place in Nigeria in the 1980s and it goes um, from present day, which present day in this book is 2008, back to the 80s. Um, and it follows this couple, um, Akin and uh, Yejide, and their marriage, the pain points, their... Um, their experiences and all of this while Nigerian, uh, Nigeria is also experiencing civil unrest. Um, so that is kind of the crux of it. And then we get into all these different subplots, and, uh, some interesting stuff from there. And what is it exactly that, why did it appeal to you so much that you were able to choose this as your best book ever? This book is so interesting. I'm really uh, drawn to stories about relationships and kind of like the internal dialogue that's very character driven, like why people make the decisions that they do, how do they make tough decisions. Um, I actually went into this book knowing very little about it, but part of it is that the cover is gorgeous, both for the Commonwealth cover and the US. I'm always drawn to a good cover, but I do love like stories that are either multi-generational or look at a marriage. I just am really drawn to those sorts of stories. And I, at the time too, was just so interested in kind of what was the history of Nigeria like? What are the lives of people like in this area? And so I was just drawn to that. You said you had gone through a, a whole bunch of Nigerian writers. Did you just sort of happen upon that or do you have a relationship to it in some way? No relationship no. to it. Was just drawn to it. Occasionally, mm -hmm. I'll just get absorbed into the literature of a certain geographic area or a certain community. I find this year I've been reading a lot more Caribbean literature. Of course, that spans you know many nations um, and a lot of diversity there. But uh, went through a phase, not phase, because I feel like ever since then, I do still pick up a lot of Nigerian literature. Um, and I do think that there's a lot of it published here in the U.S., which also helps. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've also read a lot of Egyptian literature in the past as well, Moroccan, some Algerian. 
Um, I have several authors from like Mozambique um, and Ethiopia on my list as well. And it's more just like, I know that, you know, the politics of every nation or community are so different. And so I just try and immerse myself for a period just to uh, center that's that community or those stories. And Nigeria is very complex. They have, I think, over 500 different ethnic groups and as many languages. Um, so I know I'm just barely scratching the surface there. Anti-racist books are so, they're in the news now, which is fantastic. But a lot of people I've noticed are very intimidated by the notion of reading a nonfiction book about um, the history of racism in our in America or how to be anti-racist. People can get very intimidated by that. And, and I am constantly telling people fiction works. Get to a writer who does not live where you live, who does not look like you, and you will still be learning. And this is precisely the type of book I would send people to because this story of this woman ostensibly who cannot bear children but the story is much more complex than that it is so profoundly human but also so very specific to family in Nigeria and I just I loved it so much because I felt like it was the perfect example of how you can a a book that is both window and mirror Yeah, I agree. And it's such an interesting way that you put it, like it's a window and a mirror, because I do think that there are some elements in here that are truly universal Mm -hmm. to being a woman of, you know, being in a relationship and kind of like the, the ways that we interact with each other and the ways that we treat one another and, you know, the things that we tell one another and to ourselves. Um, but then also you get a glimpse into what it's like to be, um, you know, a Yoruba woman in this time period. And, and it just kind of makes you think about things a little bit differently. Um, and also truly just centers that experience. Like it, I do appreciate this book as well, because it's not uh, founded on the whole racial dichotomy. Yeah. It's, it's just truly centering a story of people and their lives. Um, and I agree, fiction is just, such a great avenue to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. I I think there's a lot of debate right now on whether we should be able to relate to characters or not. And sometimes you'll see critical reviews and this comes up a lot among, um, you know, uh, bookstagrammers who are people of color, uh, you know, criticizing white bookstagrammers on like, Hey, of course you can't relate to this, Mm -hmm. this, story, but you shouldn't give it a critical review because you couldn't relate. Like mm-hmm. that seems like right. a very simplistic way of approaching your reading of this book. You know, there's just a lot of critique around how do we re- read stories and how do we perceive stories that are different than our own. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that this book does a really great job of just just dropping us right into a different place in time and we have to get our bearings and mm-hmm. we can get a glimpse into someone else's lives, but we can also see ourselves in it. Actually, to your point about window and mirror, I think that's actually what makes this book so compelling and really Mm -hmm. well done is that it does both of those things so well. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I just thought it was so beautiful and heartbreaking as well when you get the chapters um, from Akeem's perspective as well. It's just you, you begin to... You, because you start off the book thinking it's going to be one thing and then mm-hmm. it morphs and you get additional context and you get these little avenues that create this web around it. And then suddenly there's this infusion of a completely different perspective. And you're like, Oh wait, I need to reconsider what I was thinking about this relationship or these people. Um, and it's also a, a at the end of the day as well, a bit of a love story, but a really complicated depiction of love. And and that's what, you know, if I were to explain this as a love story, I think, you know, people who aren't big romance readers would be like, oh, I'm not sure that's for me. But I'm like, no, this is actually a very human portrayal of what love is like and how complex it is and how it, it sometimes isn't always what you think it is. Yeah. And I also thought at the end of it, my, the second I closed the book, I thought, everyone is a victim of patriarchy and it's really easy to see the initial conflict and go she's being so oppressed by this patriarchal system but like you said those chapters with Akeen he broke my heart and it really makes you go they were all victims of this system 
that told them they had to love a certain way. Yeah. And like the, it's interesting because I've been thinking a lot about like what it means to be performative. This book is definitely an example of um, performative masculinity as well. And like, how do we perform Mm. like cisgender, you know, uh, roles in heterosexual relationships and how do we just what are society's expectations of us and how do we live up to them or not live up to them and what what lengths do we go to try and meet society's expectations so I think this book does so much of that and in such a short amount of time too it's just under 300 pages she's kind of a wizard with her words because it Feels like a quick read, but boy, she packs a lot of power into into each sentence. Yes, there's so much emotional punch, and there are some scenes that I just I had to take a moment and mm-hmm. you know pull the book back down. I was like, I forgot that that had happened. I because I reread the book for uh, <laughs> our discussion, mm-hmm. and there were scenes. I, I mean, uh, will you give an, a spoiler alert before? <laughs> The sure. Entering let's, into this. Okay. Let's say right now, spoiler alert. <laughs> when we get to the point where, you know, they're about to do the naming ceremony for their first child, and then uh, Funmi, the second wife, is found dead at the foot of the stairs, and then you find out that Akina pushed her, I was shocked. Again, I forgot all about that. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then about uh, just all of that. And then, Mm -hmm. of course, the elaborate plot between, not elaborate, but the plot between Akeen and his brother in order to make his marriage work Mm -hmm. uh, with Yejide. It just, I forgot all about that. I I remember all the like high level points of what had happened, but there's so much that's going on behind the scenes that's driving the character's decisions. Mm. And that was a neat trick that, murder because we had already been set up with that false pregnancy which you're not entirely sure what's going on is she making it up is there something medical going on is she faking it is is everybody else wrong like i you kind of don't know and so you're not entirely sure could she have done that that murder <laughs> like i did not know who was going to wind up or if it was just an accident and it was a, I thought it was a very clever trick. Um, I thought so too. Mm. And the interesting like false pregnancy, I think it, I know, I also wasn't sure. Like, had she truly believed it? Did she not? I mean, we were getting the chapters at that point in time from her perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like she believed it and you know, clearly others around her did not think that that was the case. And they were trying to tell her, of course, that she was barren, which it's very interesting because throughout the rest of the book, you end up realizing that is definitely not the case. There is actually something else at play in the infertility discussion. But uh, I don't know, that was like a compelling one because I I thought that that thread may have continued further. Like when I first read the book the first time through, I was like, oh, it's going to be all these, you know, lengths that she's going to go to, to try and get pregnant, to meet society's expectations. And then it really just spokes off in a completely different direction than I'd ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And I like that they had broached, or, you know, that um, uh, Adebayo had approached this kind of upfront, you know, the introduction of me and then um, kind of the false pregnancy, because it kind of hits you up front. And then we move on to really the meat of like what's happening in this marriage and what's happening in this community. Though. Mm-hmm. So. Now you've said um, own voices several times in our conversation here. And from following you on Instagram, I know that this is a real commitment for you. Um, First, can you tell us a little bit about what you mean when you use the phrase own voices? Yeah, and actually there was a good discussion around this uh, via Instagram stories recently. I posed this question because the own voices hashtag people get, you know, have different reactions to or different um, understandings of it. From what I know, the own voices hashtag or concept came about about like, an author to character match. So an author of a certain background is writing about a character of a certain background. 
Um, but some people are like, no, own voices is author, character, and reviewer slash reader. So that own voices, if you're going to use the hashtag own voices, you must be referring to, I am own voices in reviewing this book that is written like basically for an audience like me. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I definitely use own voices more of like the, the traditional author to character match, because I just Uh feel like that's a little bit easier. I mean, if I'm, if I'm referring to an own voices review, I would tag it as such. Um, Sometimes I'll make the qualification that it's an own voices book, which means the author is writing about the community that they have the most experience with from their lived experiences. So I I just want to make sure I have this right. So um, some people say that, for example, I, as a white straight woman, would not, should not say I read own voices book when I read an LGBTQIA book because I'm not. So therefore I'm reading someone else's experience. Is that what you're telling me? Basically, like I'll, I'm trying to provide the best example of of when this cropped up. Um, But it's a little bit like if I were to read and review a book by a Latinx author, Mm -hmm. writing, writing about a Latinx character and that community, um, there are some folks who believe that I should not tag that them with own voices because okay. I am not own voices for that book or that author. Okay. Um, but I think originally, and I would need to look this back up of the origins of own voices. I thought it was the connection between the author and the character, not author, character, reader. Okay. Given that there is nuance to this, um, I want to ask you, Tell me about your commitment to reading so diversely, because following you on Instagram, I I know that this is a very important thing to you. Is this something that um, you gravitate to naturally? How active is that process for you? You know, it's, it's interesting because I actively started diversifying my reading probably about five years ago. I started paying more attention. Again, I started reading different blogs online. I started seeing people talking about like diversifying their reading, like black authors that they were reading, Asian authors that they were reading, things like that. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I want to learn more about these cultures as well. You know, I'm looking for just an opportunity to see other parts of what life could be. But then I noticed in the last year or so, I'd stopped being as dialed into it. The Slack group that I'd mentioned had kind of gone away. It had kind of run its course. And so I didn't really have an outlet to talk to people all the time about books. And so if I was reading, it was a lot of business books, a lot of nonfiction, which is really dominated by uh, white authors. And I just think that to some extent, it does need to be an active decision to go out there and do the research to see what's out there. I mean, Britt Bennett, Yaa Jesse, they're phenomenal and amazing, and they're definitely getting a lot of coverage. Um, but also, they're a little bit the anomaly still. I mean, there are big books that are going to get released all the time. They're going to get really big budgets, and they're released by white authors. So I do think you have to be a little bit intentional because it's so easy to just be like, well, this new book is out. And if if the new book's out this week, there are 20 that you know the New York Times might be raving about or you know, all the different um, literary critics are raving about, and one of them might be by an author of color. Mm -hmm. So I do think you need to do a little bit more digging. You need to actively intend to seek out other stories that might differ from mainstream American culture. And it's also what you like, though, as well. I mean, you're not doing it as a way to give yourself homework. No, absolutely not. And actually, that is a big reason why I'm not reading much nonfiction this year, because it just Mm -hmm. feels a little bit like work. Um, No, I'm definitely a mood reader, which Uh actually has been a little bit difficult for me this month. And I'll get to that in a second. (laughs) Um, But I tend to just gravitate towards really compelling character driven stories. I even noticed that the character driven element really follows me through my genre reading, like the mysteries I love are very character driven the fantasy books I like are very character driven and um, just more internal than maybe like big, active, explosive plot, uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But 
there's a phenomenon of buddy reading on bookstagram which is you you kind of pair up you find people who want to read a book around the same time you might divide it into chapters or just regroup at the end but i overcommitted myself i'm a moderately fast reader but i decided to buddy read like four books in august and i I'm just overwhelmed and I just feel a little bit like I'm just running around from book to book and not really reading what just feels right based on the moment. So I just need to be a little bit better about balancing (laughs) this. This is a a problem of my own making. (laughs) Right. But when you don't overcommit to buddy reading, that sounds like a lot of fun. It is. It's a lot of fun. I'm really excited. I just finished reading um, A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marilyn James with a group of three other people. And I'm so glad I did as a buddy read because it is a tremendously difficult book. It's extremely challenging, um, at least for me. It just gave me pause about like how much I didn't know about the Cold War or Bob Marley or the history of Jamaica. It's told from like 20 different characters' perspectives spanning like 20 years um, in Jamaica and New York and in stream of consciousness style writing. So it is, it was definitely a, a, an adventure. (laughs) So So what is the process of that? Do you check in on Instagram or is this all done through DMs or how does a buddy read work? Yeah. So we've been doing it through DMs. That's usually how I've done buddy reads. Um, A couple have gone through text just because it's a little bit easier and uh, we don't have to wait around for Instagram notifications. And with A Brief History of Seven Killings, we did break it up into roughly 20 to 30 page chunks uh, throughout the um, uh, throughout the month. With most of the buddy reads, it's more like, hey, let's just check in. You know, if someone really wants to talk about something, just make sure everyone's, you know, already kind of at that point. Or we'll just talk about the end and share our thoughts and feelings about it. And while we don't all always post about the book afterwards on there, it is kind of nice. You get to see everyone's reviews. We can all share them. It's a very, like, Mm -hmm. communal kind of thing. That book sounds fascinating, though. I've never heard of it before. Yeah, it's very good. I was talking to somebody else. um, They're reading the Book of Night Women, which is another of Marlon James's books. And uh, they were saying that it was definitely throwing them for a loop. He just is a very um, gifted, challenging writer. Like he just operates on a different plane of existence from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how he can write from so many different voices and have them feel distinct um, to have all these like intricate plot points. It's just really phenomenal. Now, I want to go back to, you said you love character-driven books, and you specifically said mysteries. Um, I'm fairly new to mysteries in the last five years or so. I've never really been into them. So I'm really curious, what is a character-driven mystery? I would say that a character-driven mystery is one in which uh, the detective or, you know, the protagonist that we're following along Um, is having a lot of like internal debate of processing either what had happened and making sense of it and trying to place it within, you know, A, what exactly happened here? Like who, who done it? But then also like, does this tell us something about human instinct or what motivates people to kill or to, 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 commit a crime of some kind. So my favorite series is Louise Penny's Inspector mm-hmm. Among a Bosch, <laughs> uh, which I could see you nodding. Well, that's um, what got me into mysteries because I kept yeah. reading about her books and I-, I read the first one and went, this is not what I thought mysteries were. Yes. And they, that's what I would define as character driven, but I read all of her books. I really like them. I thought the first couple books were a little bit weaker. It was clear she was kind of getting her, Mm -hmm. her feet under her, trying to figure out the voice and the tone. There was some humor that kind of didn't really click until you get to later books and you see everyone like have these deep connections with one another in Three Pines. Mm -hmm. So yeah, huge Louise Penny fan. And besides Louise Penny, can you think of any others that are character driven? I'm digging here because I'm almost through the series until the next one comes out. And I don't know where I'm going to go next. And I'm scared of blood and gore. I should tell you that as well. (laughs) Oh, okay. I was going to say, I'm like, hmm. Okay. Jane Harper's books are pretty good. They are a little 
okay. They're a little oh, they're bit so more good. intense, I think, um, like visually, not like gory, but they're a little bit more intense, I would say, than the Louise Penny series. Mm-hmm. Jane Harper's books are really good. And she has a new one out at the end of September. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. It's called The Survivors, I think. Oh, uh, so man. anyway. Is it that so. same, um, the man, I forgot the detective's name. Is it in that same series as Dry and... The Force of Nature. Yeah, Aaron Force Falk. of Nature. I don't know that it is the oh, same. Because she had, The Lost Man was mm. her book that was separate from that series, mm. I believe. I'm not sure about The Survivors. I just, it's on my TBR and I figure I'll get to it down the road. And did you see that, um, to go back to two conversations ago, did you see that Yad, Yad Jesse has a book coming out, I believe, October? Have you read yes. it? Yes. I have not. Um, I pre-ordered it and I am like counting down the days. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, uh, so Yad Jesse and um, uh, Tracy Chi has a book out called We Are Not Free, which is about Japanese internment during mm. World War II. And Alyssa Cole has her first thriller, like mystery thriller out. And I like her romances a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Though her historical romances taking place in the Civil War are a little bit stressful for a romance, I will put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that one's called When No One Is Watching. And it's been um, compared to Get Out, the movie. And so I'm pretty excited for that one. Okay, so. I couldn't watch Get Out. I was too scared, even though I, <laughs> I'm really a chicken. But my husband did tell me the entire plot. And so... I might not be able to read that one, even though I love Alyssa Cole so much. I might, I'll I might have to know. stay away from that. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> I'll let you know. Cause I, I'm really excited about that one. And I don't mind some gore. I would, this isn't a mystery, but I would maybe stay away from Mexican Gothic. If you find like certain things too creepy or disturbing, um, there's definitely, it's very much a Gothic book as opposed to like uh-huh. magical realism, which some people have been erroneously categorizing it as. That's what I kept seeing. And you know what? That just showed up on my library queue just today that it has arrived for me. <laughs> well, <laughs> it isn't gory. It's just kind of creepy and foreboding. It's it, okay. very, very gothic. Uh-huh. There, when I read it, I was like, ooh, it's like Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer meets Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Wow. Right? But taking place in Mexico, I mean, of course, it has like a ton of really amazing um, just characterization. It feels very creepy. I don't know why I keep saying creepy, but that's really honestly the only word I can think of for it. It's definitely unforgettable. I'll put it that way. You know what fascinates me also about this book is something shallow is the cover reminds me of all of the, I don't know why, but every time I look at the cover, I think it's a Beatrice Williams book. You know, the one who wrote like Cocoa Beach. Yes. And I always think it's a, and so it feels like it's going to be a very sweet sort of, not her books aren't sweet, but you know, historical fiction and I know that's not what's happening but the cover I think is a little deceptive it's true and speaking of deceptive covers Beach Read by Emily Henry it came out at the beginning of the summer ish I I gotten it back when I saw the book of the month membership and I read it and I was like this cover does not match the plot whatsoever Mm -mm. it looks very easy breezy like oh brighter is just swapping places and then it ends up being like this interesting exploration of grief and it's much more of a contemporary romance um but but interlaced with these complexities that isn't just so like lighthearted. I'll put it that way yeah they I, I I'm not a fan of that cover either I think they missed the boat on that one because well I'm not a big fan of the cartoon covers in general it's a very specific book I think the cartoon it is covers. and it's very funny because like the more illustrated covers are definitely really popular right now in women's lit and contemporary romance. I personally gravitate towards them. I think they're a little bit, um, I don't know, it, it's tough because it, they're more socially acceptable to be reading those than say a historical romance with like a, you know, a, like a man and a woman like clutching each other on the cover <laughs> the clinch uh-huh. <laughs> right so um but you know fortunately I will say historical romance has you know said we're you know I am still seeing that trend in historical romance of like we're not going to shy away from featuring people on the cover because at the end of the day they are looking at a love 
story between people. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also love too, that we're seeing a lot more diversity in historical romance, like Cat Sebastian and some other authors, um, K.J. Charles, I think is another, Mm -hmm. um, where you'll see, you know, depictions of like same-sex couples and things like that um, in, you know, full Victorian style garb. Mm, Me too. Um, tell me, so what are you reading right now? I guess, the, I guess, are they all four buddy reads? <laughs> for Instagram? Or is there well, anything you're reading on your own steam? <laughs> yeah, so uh, let me talk briefly about buddy reads. So I'm reading, I'm rereading Home Fire by Camilla Shamsi. I read it a couple of years ago, loved it. I had mentioned it on a um, in a comment on someone else's post that I'd wanted to reread it, and then it kind of spawned into like a seven person buddy read. So that's happening right now. Um, really loving revisiting that book. It's the it's a book where the ending makes the entire book. So I'll leave I it at it, that. I have it right there on my shelf. Haven't read it yet though. Oh, so, it's so it's, good. Okay, it's gonna move so up the good. list. Okay. <laughs> yep. And then I'm also reading The Dragon Republic by R.F. Kong. Uh, that is the sequel to The Poppy War. And the third book is out in November. It's called The Burning God. Uh, it's a uh, East Asian inspired fantasy epic that uh, is a fictionalized version of the Sino-Japanese War. So I'm really loving that right now. It's it's very um, complex and the protagonist is very frustrating in a myriad of ways. And it's a, it's a good book to discuss with people. It, it does have very hard subject matter and it's a little bit gory though. So I would mention that. So not for um, <laughs> I, I would probably shy away from that one. Um, and then I'm just about to start um, a couple of other books, but I can't decide what to. So I feel like I'll just sit down with the stack tonight and then figure it out from there. Okay, what's it between? I'll give you my vote. Okay, Not that you so give got... a shit what my vote is. <laughs> I'll wait no, in anyway. I love it. <laughs> um, I am between um, Big Little Man by Alex Tizan. He is a, um, he's a late Filipino-American author um, and he's writing a lot about uh, his own experiences. It's a memoir. So that's on my list. I've got The Last Story of Mina Lee by um, Nancy Jeon Kim. Let me let me just double check. Nancy Jeon Kim. And then I'm not sure. I think I've got like a stack of other stuff that just came in. <laughs> I don't know. I just I went a little wild buying some used books and so they are currently quarantining in my garage right now and I need to bring them inside. Are bookstores open in Utah? They are so Mm -hmm. in um, my county uh, you you can go to stores and things like that but you uh, have to mask up right now and social distance and things like that Um, but I am trying to you know limit my excursions out (laughs) in the world. And what about your library? Is your library open? It is only for curbside pickup, Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of nice though, but um, it definitely makes a little bit more coordination and you just need to give a little more time on either end between pickup and uh, drop off to to get holds and things like that. I, um, ours is the same way and it's great. I'm thrilled that it exists at all, but to those of us who were library kids as you were and as I was, uh, this is gonna sound so crazy, but I think you might get it. I miss the smell of my library so much. (laughs) There is the the second you walk in, it just smells like books. And I miss just, I miss running my fingers along the spines. And I I can't imagine ever doing that again. I'll be afraid to touch everything when I go back. But gosh, (laughs) I know exactly. (laughs) I also find that I read a lot more nonfiction when I have access to the library for whatever reason. Like I tend to buy more fiction. But then nonfiction, I'll like, I don't know why, there's always something about like just meandering the Dewey Decimal System, like pick, mm-hmm. like looking up the book, figuring out where to find it. Um, it's really satisfying. And I think then, it's because it's really low risk. I notice when I wander and I go, you know, there's a whole book about an octopus. Well, I'm getting that because who cares? It doesn't cost me anything. And then it turns out to be this incredible book. And that has happened to me so many times where I just pick it up because it's low risk at the library. Yeah. Is it The Soul of an Octopus? Yes. Have you read it? 
I have. I actually did that one on audio a few years ago, and I thought it was really great on audio. Oh, I bet it is. <laughs> and she, the, Saya Montgomery actually does the narration for it, which is oh. why, because you can hear the emotion in her voice, which is so great. It is a beautiful book and so unexpected. Who would think that they are so fascinating? Very fascinating. Yeah. Um, I actually was listening to that. It's funny how certain books will stick in my mind if I'm traveling and I'll just associate with that time and place. Yes. But I was actually there for a business trip in Seattle and had been walking around and I had just walked by the Seattle Aquarium. And it was just very interesting because I was thinking, you know, I was listening to the story about octopuses because it's not octopi you find that right. out in the book um <laughs> and like what it's like for them in captivity and things like that and so I, I was just wandering around thinking about that I'm a little bit of a picky audiobook listener I mm -hmm. just I have a harder time with um fiction on audio I need a really good like narrator who really imbues a lot of emotion um and so like, but I also find nonfiction a little bit easier to consume on audio. So I'm always like, eh, hmm. I always get them from the library for that reason. Mm -hmm. I'm all over the place. That's interesting. I find that I'm the opposite. I really, I know a lot of people who do all of their nonfiction on audio and I actually can't stand nonfiction on audio oh. with a couple of exceptions. I, I listened to H is for Hawk on audio and it was beautiful. Also read by the author. And yeah. that makes a big difference, I think. I think so too, um, you know, provided that the narrator, you know, is really emotional and like has that feeling that they can bring to the narration. But I find like memoir works really well on audio. Mm. Um, of course, like celebrity memoir works really well on audio because they obviously know what they're doing in terms of acting and the performance elements of it. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, fiction, I have a hard time with though. Cause I just find I'll like get distracted and then I'll come back and I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. Right. So, right. I have one exception to that or well, a couple of exceptions to that, which is Elizabeth Acevedo's books. I will listen to all of them on audio because she, she narrates them and she's clearly just a phenomenal like poet and can, you know, just narrate her work in such a phenomenal way. Um, but then and also it, surprisingly, The Cutting Stone by Attica Locke. I always recommend that one too. I've read the two East Texas books, the Bluebird, Bluebird, and um, what's the second Heaven My one? Home. Heaven My Home. Yeah, this one's really good. It's one of her older ones. Okay, my vote for your next Perfect. read is the memoir because I'm on a bit of a memoir kick right now. So I can't wait till you tell us what you, what you chose ultimately. <laughs> cool. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm looking forward to sharing more. I've got tons of books on my list and tons of reviews that I need to write up and post and, you know, <laughs> love it. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you online so they can read all your book reviews and see what you're up to. <laughs> yeah. You can find me on Instagram at, at reading mountains. Um, and you'll, find me there throughout the week. I usually post every couple of days and mostly reviews with some stack photos and hopefully thoughtful discussions. What does the name mean? Reading mountains. You know, I was debating. I just like was trying to come up with a name and I live in the mountains in Utah and I was trying to figure out like a play on that and like Mount TBR. Cause there's always this joke Ugh. that like our, our like TBRs are just like growing larger and larger and larger. They're becoming a mountain. Um, and so that's a little bit of a joke that I have with some friends. Like I think a lot of readers have that <laughs> as well, uh, talking about Mount TBR. So for me, I was like, this seems like a good nod to both of those things. Yeah. Lovely. I love it. This has been wonderful. I feel like I found a new reading soul sister. Yes, I agree. And I can't wait to talk to you about the next Lucy's Honey book when it's out. I can't wait. <laughs> Jess, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Julie. Thanks for listening, book nerds. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, please go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com, or follow the podcast on Instagram at bestbookever. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie Wrote a Book. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it on social media and leave a review on whatever podcatcher you use. Reviews really help our visibility to new listeners, and we are grateful for everyone. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.